it became a new patient. And we always do the same testing with everybody. You know, we do the organic acids profile. And then I'll show you the other testing he did. Uh, sorry, I was skipping around here. Uh, he did the 41H test. I can show you that in a moment. He did the GI map test as well. And uh, he did a Dutch test. Okay, so that's my current workup now. Organic acids. Uh, 401H, GI map, and the, and the Dutch test. It's a lot of data. Look at that. It's like 20 pages of labs. Okay, so anyways, let's go back and look at him. The, the, the interesting thing about this case is that, and I love when people do this, um, he just created a learning experience for me by going off and doing his completely own thing. And he kind of snuck around uh, how I have my clinic structured in a clever way that no one's ever done before. I mean, he didn't really break a rule or anything. He just kind of created a new rule. So I'll show you how my clinic works in that we have the Kalish Wellness website. You can go into the website under products and go uh, supplements and labs. And this is all password protected. So, you know, if um, only patients can get in here, right? You need a the password is wellness. is not the most complicated password to crack, probably. But um, and then once you're in here, uh, you can order uh, uh, supplements, and you can order your own test kits. And the, obviously, we do that so that when when patients uh, are ready to do a retest, they can just go in and order their own test. And here's the organics profile and all that good stuff. Yeah. So um, what this fellow did, which is entertaining to say the least, is he did his initial round of testing. And you can see it was the Dutch test, a 41H, a GI map, and an organics profile. I mean, it's a hefty amount of testing all my patients have to go through. You know, it's a lot of labs. And then he was a vegan and has been a vegan for a little while, um, I think off and on most of his life. And then he wanted to see what would happen if he started to eat meat and dairy. And so he spent about two weeks, somewhere between two and three weeks, eating meat and eating dairy. And then he snuck into our store and he ordered another organics profile without me knowing it. And again, this is like not a bad thing. And, and he retested himself. And so when we did his consult, we had all these labs. So I want to show you his vegan lab. So this is him eating a whole food plant-based diet. And you can see there's a B complex marker positive, one detox marker, and two bacterial markers for the gut. So let's forget about the gut markers for a moment because he also has C. difficile and all these other gut problems. So outside of the gut, he had one detox marker and one B vitamin marker. And that was it, which is not bad for somebody who's got C. difficile and all these other digestive tract problems, right? And who's, you know, fatigued all the time. Not bad. And in fact, he told me, and he kind of started the conversation with this, that he always feels the best. He's eating a full whole foods, plant-based diet. And that he knows that I'm really interested in, you know, focusing on high fat, uh, high protein diet. So he switched to that and then retested himself, which is not entirely true. But anyways, let's just look at his test. And this was a couple weeks later, okay? He only ate the, he only ate the, high meat, high dairy diet for like two to three weeks. Look what happened. It's really quite remarkable. So you, you can see <laughs> it's just turned into a bloodbath here. So on the first test, he had one B, one B vitamin marker and one detox marker. Okay, he still has those, but he managed to give himself an ethyl malinate problem, an energy production problem, a couple more B vitamin marker issues created a methylation issue with fig glue or fermented glutamate. And the most interesting thing about all this was that he managed to create in enough inflammation in his body that he raised up quinolinate and picolinate in just two, three weeks of eating food, the wrong foods for his body. And he ended up creating an antioxidant problem all at the same time. Now, of course, he didn't feel very good while he was doing the what for him is the wrong diet. 
And in fact, he started to get depressed and anxious and OCD type symptoms really flared up, which is his main problem. And so now, uh, really quite remarkable, look at that. He was able to raise quinolinate and picolinate by creating inflammation in his body. Now granted he has these digestive tract infections we can look at in a moment too, but he primarily did this with food. Okay, So again, let's look at the plant-based whole food diet lab. And I didn't have anything to do with this, right? This guy just went out on his own and did this all by himself. So here's his plant-based whole food diet lab. Again, one B vitamin marker, pyroglutamate, and a couple things for the gut. But let's forget about the gut for now because that's kind of a separate issue we can look at in a moment. But what, in all, for all intents and purposes, one B vitamin marker and one detox marker, he's eating whole foods, plant-based diet, feeling better than he has on any other diet. He switches over to meat and dairy, and three weeks later, two and a half weeks later, this is what happens. He still has the same B vitamin marker, but now, and he has the same pyroglutamate, so those two are the same. But he's added now oxidative damage. He's added quinolinate and picolinate. The brain is inflamed, right? The body's inflamed, and the brain is paying the price. He's created a methylation problem, multiple B vitamin issues. His mitochondria are starting to take a hit, and and he's got a carnitine problem. Now, one of the interesting things about this was, you know, carnitine we usually think of as being present in red meat. So you think if this guy started to eat red meat, why would he develop carnitine deficiency? And carnitine is burned up or used up, of course, when we're inflamed. So uh, it's one of the most interesting things I've seen in a really long time. Now, let's grab Carolyn. She had a question here. Carolyn, you there? Yeah, hi. Hey. So I'm just I'm just curious if you know the type of of meat and dairy he was eating. Was it uh, industrial or was it you know was he getting a lot more pesticides? Was he continuing with his vegetables? You know, I'm just curious as to you know what this would any you know is it any yeah. meat or is it a specific? He meat? had he had a plan. He had a very clear plan. This guy. I, I, Out to I gotta, prove you wrong. <laughs> he had a he had a plan. He, he this is so funny. I mean, I can't even believe. I'm I'm just staying in practice the rest of my life just for the entertainment value. It's better than watching like comedies. Um, he had a plan. He ate, and he's um, we'll call him Kevin. That's not his real name, but he's um, you know, from India originally. He's been in America his whole life. You know, his family's from India, so he he wanted to go go American or go home kind of thing, right? So he had. Uh, a piece of pizza every day for lunch. This is true. If he had a piece of pizza every day for lunch, this is like you know trying to mimic the American diet. He had a piece of cheesecake every day. He had a piece of pizza every day, a piece of cheesecake every day, and he said, well, you know, I had a bowl of cereal with milk. Now, clearly, this was like disdainful and unpleasant to him to do, but he was just trying to be all American, you know? In, in, a, in a way, like, I wonder what happens if I start with a high animal product high fat kind of diet. So yeah, bowl of cereal with milk every day, piece of cheesecake. I don't know where he got the cheesecake idea from, but I think it's hilarious. And then a slice of pizza for lunch every day. And then, and some, meat, off the and then some meat. And then some meat. It wasn't just adding meat and dairy, he also went off whole foods. Yeah, yeah, so and he threw in soda. Food. And he threw in soda. So you're, yeah, yeah. so it's, you can't blame it just on the, the meat and the dairy. Is that, I mean, how can you distinguish? No, no, it's, a, it's an indictment over our, I think this is an indictment yeah. on the American diet in general, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, more so than it is specifically an argument for whole foods plant-based. But, and it really reminds me of this film. If you guys haven't seen, have, have you seen this movie, The Super Size Me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so those of you that haven't seen it, uh, Morgan Spurlock does the exact same thing. He spends 30 days eating McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, makes himself incredibly sick, and... Um, I think around the second or third week of the film, it's a documentary, he's filming himself as he goes through this month of McDonald's, he goes in to see his conventional physician, they run these blood tests, and his, his liver enzymes are like through the roof. And the medical doctor is uh, just not believing this. There's this whole scene where the MD is just like, this isn't possible, there's no way your diet could do this in just a few weeks. And um, 
you know, he's starting to develop a fatty liver, and his mom calls and says, Morgan, you got to stop the diet, you're going to die, and you know, everyone's kind of medically concerned about this poor guy. Um, but you know, what this drove home for me was kind of like a supersize me experiment um, for this fellow, and the fact that you can cause that much inflammation in just like two, two and a half, three weeks, I, I didn't. I wouldn't have thought it was possible. I really wouldn't have. Because when we correct these problems on the flip side, like when I see a patient that comes in with a lab that looks like uh, the post test here, I'm usually thinking, you know, six to 12 months to clear up all these problems. This guy generated the problems in like two or three weeks. It's really quite phenomenal. Um, and the funny part is that I'm, you know, not against whole foods, plant-based diets, and I, I think I have to start talking about it more and more. Uh, publicly because it's what I'm doing in my practice. It's what I do in my personal life too. And uh, this fellow just kind of provoked the conversation. So very happy for him to go back on his uh, whole foods plant-based diet and uh, to stay away from meat and dairy. I really think it's uh, kind of fascinating. But here, let's look at the rest of his case too. There are definitely some people for whom meat is a bad idea and for whom dairy is a bad idea, obviously. Uh, and I think, you know, if I think about the history of functional medicine, you know, everyone that trained me was pro-meat. Most people that trained me were anti-dairy unless it was raw, in which case, some cases, raw dairy was okay. But, you know, amongst all the functional medicine doctors that I, I was trained by, there was a pretty strong anti-vegetarian, pro-meat bias. And I, st I still see that carrying through professionally at all the seminars and whatnot. And what I'm seeing now is that a certain percentage of my patients, like this fellow here, actually do much, much better on a whole foods, plant-based diet with zero meat and zero dairy and zero animal fat at all. And I guess it's a matter of figuring out who those patients are, you know, um, how to select them out. And, and, uh, Figuring that part out it maybe is not the easiest thing. So he also had C. difficile toxins A and B, which is kind of interesting. And long-standing GI problems. And then on his uh, GI MAP test, uh, they found some E. coli and uh, some fungal overgrowth, microsporidia. He had a CIGA problem, some enzyme-related issues. And then on his Dutch test, he had unsurprisingly, a lot of inflammation. This is a really interesting lab, too. Let me show you this one. Uh, check this out. And any of you who want to chime in, please do, because I know a lot of you guys are doing or, uh, these uh, Dutch tests. But having an organics profile, a Dutch test, and a, and a couple of stool tests on a patient, it really feels like you've got a lot of information. So this is a man who's 24 years old, Estrogen, elevated, all three of them, E1, E2, E3, all elevated, testosterone, elevated, and progesterone, elevated, and his andro uh, androgens, also elevated. So Bree and I were talking about this the other day. Let me see if I can grab Bree there. This is like someone who would not be a great candidate for DHEA, right? Hello? Hey, Bri, you there? Yeah, hey, I'm there. I'm trying to, I'm on my iPhone, so I'm actually trying to get a closer look at which lab this is. Oh, well, yeah, 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 totally. So this is like a, a poster child for don't use DHEA. Um, right. <laughs> because testosterone, estrogen, and all the androgen, what do you call it, like metabolites are all through the roof elevated, so. Exactly. Um, we were talking about this the other day, so I think one of the things the Dutch test does is it helps you find ahead of time who the good DHEA folks are from the bad DHEA folks, so you don't end up walking into that minefield. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, especially with the alpha DHT being dominant like that. Yeah, that's been your experience too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I had um, a couple of women who complained of hair loss after taking the DHEA. And we weren't sure if it was related to DHEA or, you know, some other um, cause, you know, anemia or thyroid or something. But 
when I finally got the Dutch results and saw like that marker that you have over there, the 5-alpha DHT being, you know, so predominant like that, <clears throat> it was clear that it was definitely related to the DHEA. So. Yeah, and so, so for people that are new to this, there's this little gauge thing they have. Um, there's so much information on this one report, it's, it's really insane. But there's this um, gauge they have here, I guess it's called 5-alpha reductase activity. And basically, my understanding is if the gauge is to the right, it's a potential androgen problem, and you want to be careful about using DHEA. If the gauge is neutral or to the left, then probably DHEA is okay. Although I've already had a couple of exceptions to that rule where um, if, if the androgen marker is over to the right and the person has other reasons for you to be cautious about using DHEA, you should avoid it. But I've had one or two cases already where the androgen marker was all the way to the right, but the person had zero risk factors for taking DHEA, so we still used it and it, it worked fine. But I think this fellow, we, you'd be a little cautious just because all these other hormones are are so elevated, you know? Mm -hmm. Cool stuff, isn't it? So the, the funny thing about this lab, too, is that it... um. It all comes back to the same variables, you know, like why would this be happening? Um, inflammation, chronic inflammation drives in men and women uh, testosterone up, estrogen levels up, causes all these imbalances. Uh, the other factoid on this fellow here, melatonin levels were slightly elevated and uh, his cortisol pattern was... Uh, elevated in the morning, the waking level was elevated, crashed down to normal in the afternoon, and then elevated at night. So he's running like a, a high cortisol pattern uh, the majority of the time. Okay, and then the other little thing that Carrie Jones, the lab, some of you I'm sure have talked with her, always focuses on this portion here, whether the hormones are staying on the cortisone side, or on the cortisol side, and um, this fellow had it more towards the cortisol side, which implies that he's inflamed, whereas if the cortisone side is elevated, it implies there's more emotional stress as a variable. Okay, So he's basically super, super inflamed, which is not surprising because he has C. difficile toxins A and B, plus a yeast overgrowth, and a whole bunch of gut problems. Um, really quite remarkable that they could do all this. Anyways, I thought that was an interesting case. So I'm, I'm probably, um, I'm using more and more of these whole foods, plant-based diets with people for weight loss. Um, I used it with a patient uh, this week who's got a major cholesterol problem. People are really interested and uh, receptive to the idea and um, certainly think it's got its place as one of our tools. Been so focused on meat for so long that I'm trying to balance things out in my practice. And I think I already mentioned this, we're going to have Dr. Esselstyn give a talk on July 20th to this group, who's one of the leading whole foods plant-based doctors. Uh, he's the cardiovascular surgeon at Cleveland Clinic that's kind of devoted his life to explaining to people about how important vegetables are. And I think one of the things I've noticed psychologically from patients in doing diet coaching is that regardless of what you actually say, people will get a general impression of what they're supposed to do. And it doesn't matter how many times you try to correct for this. But if you say the word paleo, and you say the word butter is good, you know, raw dairy is good, meat is good, even if you try to um, frame that properly, what people are impressed with and people actually do is they overconsume the food that they think is good for them. So when they, people learn animal fat is good, they'll overconsume animal fat. When people learn meat is good, they overconsume meat. And now I think we have a whole generation of people who are just overconsuming meat and raw dairy, um, way more protein than any human being could ever possibly need. And the thing I think that gives us a sort of secret advantage with these whole foods plant-based diets is that the emphasis is on plant-based foods. So those are the things that are healthy. So now, all of a sudden, you've got um, an, 
overly a, a patient whose mind is overly focused on vegetables and a little bit of fruit which is a much safer kind of thing to have going than a patient who's overly focused on meat and animal products and so when the whole foods plant-based diet person cheats they might have a little chicken or a little fish all right and that's not going to be a bad thing uh, by any means as a matter of fact maybe it's even a good thing to mix up the plant-based diet with a little bit of animal products here and there uh, but that's a much different thing than someone eating uh, over consuming um, protein and dairy uh, uh, animal products and dairy so let me grab Larry hey Larry oh hi Dan <clears throat> good morning hey. yeah I was just wondering so are, are they are they getting meeting their protein requirements from the veggies or are they also doing beans and uh, you know whatever else fermented soy products or whatever yeah so this is like the one of the central questions right and and you think that we'd have a clear answer on this but the the kind of the question behind your question is how much protein do human beings need you know right and I've heard still I've, I've heard you know anywhere I know on the low end you know 0.75 grams per kilogram up to what dr. Morse says you know depending on stress levels and performance needs up to 1.2 1.4 grams but I haven't heard anything less than 0.75 which is pretty low but they're still gonna have to eat some you know either a lot of veggies or they're gonna have to eat some kind of beans or something a little higher than uh, yeah now the the whole foods plant-based people are strong on beans yet they're yes to beans they're yes to moderate amounts of non GMO soy and that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. So people are getting some protein from those areas. But you know, what's really interesting to me is what happens, I mean, here's the thing is that in, I think within, there's a reason why functional medicine has always been so meat and kind of animal product centric, whether it's bone broth or raw butter or, you know, grass fed meat. It's because a lot of the patients that we work with are ill or sick in a way that's very specific that requires an avoidance of grains and an accelerated consumption of animal fat and animal protein to heal. And I totally get that. I mean, because we see this in practice. Like, with a lot of my patients, if I put them on a plant-based diet, they would wither away and die. They would get really sick because they can't eat. Some of the patients I work with can't even digest a vegetable. They can't even eat a salad, you know? They're so, they've got so messed up. And then when I look at the plant-based doctors, Esselstyn, Campbell, Gregor, McDougall, Ornish, all these guys, they're, and we look at who they're working with patient-wise, they're not working with the same chronically ill, MTHFR, SCD, GAP diets crowd that we are, you know? They're working with people who are like fat and have diabetes, or people who have uh, their first heart attack but they survived, now they want to get healthy, you know? and if you look at the research they're doing and what happens with their patients, people get miraculously cured from these whole foods, plant-based diets really quickly. In a matter of weeks or months, you see the labs changing in, in ways that no medication ever could. And yet, if we use these diets indiscriminately with our patient population of chronically ill folks that tend to come to medicine doctors, um, you know, we'd have a lot of sick people on our hands. The, the diet would make them worse. So I think that... Um, a couple things. One is that I'm trying to personally, in my own practice, break out of this chronic illness niche. You know, if someone says the word low histamine diet FODMAPs to me one more time, I'm about to, like, you know, start screaming and breaking windows. I really want to look at a greater population of people. And I look around our country and I see. Even in my community here in Oakland, I see diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, people that would never see a functional medicine doctor in the way that I've structured my practice. And so I want to be able to offer the whole foods plant-based diet solution, and, and it may well mean working with a different patient population than I'm used to, um, which actually I'm kind of excited about, to be honest. Like I got this one patient, it's already happening. This week I got this one patient, her cholesterol is like, I forget, it was like some crazy, crazy number I never heard of. I'm like, oh, well, let's try this whole foods plant-based diet. There's a lot of research behind it that shows that it might knock your cholesterol down. Now, a couple of years ago, I would have ignored that or just referred her to someone else for help, you know, because I didn't 
really want to work with. And I got a high blood pressure patient last week too, who um, she already started her whole foods plant-based diet before she came to see me. She um, lost 15 pounds, knocked her blood pressure down like 40 or 50 points, and she just wanted some advice about, you know, what could she do next. And so for me, it's kind of opening up the practice to a different patient demographic um, and, and mixing things up a little bit f away from the purely chronic illness crowd that, um, that tends to infiltrate functional medicine practices pretty thoroughly, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it boils down again to the, the key of figuring out the metabolic typing, uh, you know, because some people get those same kind of results, drops in cholesterol or whatever from going paleo and removing, you know, the grains and the beans and all that, and whereas I guess I can see where another cohort might, you know, do really well on that plant-based thing. So you got to yeah. figure out who's who. Yeah, and then I think also people change, you know. So, like, if someone has H. pylori, C. difficile, and Giardia, their reactions to animal protein and dairy could be either good or bad because of the GI infections. And when those GI infections are gone, they could flip and either go from paleo to plant-based or from plant-based to paleo. Mm -hmm. You know, because I with some patients with these really bad GI problems, they can't digest meat at all. It just makes them sick. And yeah, other patients that. who have these, really, you know, the opposite. They can't digest grains at all. Right, and there's the food sensitivity issue as well. I mean, if they're he, this guy's never had dairy in his life or whatever, you know, or it's not in his genes, um, that's going to be a problem too. That's going to cause all that inflammation. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't know yet. Like, I think the thing is that each of us is sort of our pra our our mindset as a clinician is clouded by the kinds of patients that come in, and I've been doing just fine for 24 years with a heavy emphasis on meat and animal product diets. In fact, I would say for the majority of my career, if I got a vegetarian or a vegan who was sick, I would just reflexively blame the diet as having created the problem, you know? And now I'm kind of trying to broaden my horizons a little bit and realize that it's a little more nuanced and complex than that. Yeah, well, I'll be, I'll be very interested to hear Dr. Esselstyn speak. Um, yeah, for that for that reason, to see how people are doing it, you know, and eating enough in general. I I find that it's it's hard for people to overeat protein. Their body kind of just has a natural kind of stopping place when you when you're getting too much. I don't know if you that's your experience, but I've I've heard that from lots of places also. Yeah, I mean, it just makes people want to throw up. I mean, people don't binge on chicken ever. It's the same thing with the plant based diets, you know, because um, Assuming you're doing it properly, I mean, you could be a really, I mean, and this is where it gets confusing again. You could have a patient who has an extremely unhealthy gluten-free diet. As a matter of fact, there's whole sections of the grocery store that emphasize unhealthy gluten-free foods. Um, you can have a patient who has an unhealthy paleo diet or an unhealthy plant-based diet, right? So if a plant-based diet is done right, the volume of vegetables that you eat fills you up, keeps your blood sugar stable lowers your blood sugars, lowers your, it does all kinds of good things. But, you know, a plant-based diet where a person's eating a lot of uh, bagels or something like that, you know, and a lot of, um, you know, flour type products is going to kind of go poorly. But, you know, you find them, and this is what I find for myself now, is that, uh, I mean, vegetables kind of give you this feeling of satiation that, you know, probably even faster than meat or fat would in terms of, uh, and compared to the volume of calories, the number of calories, and in comparison to the, nu the, the nutrient density, you know, so you end up getting really rich nutrient density with the vegetables. And, and as we all know, like everyone on every one of these diets is under eating vegetables. I mean, that's kind of like the main problem that we're facing. So this is another kind of sneaky way of trying to work around that, you know. Yeah, I get that. All right. Cool. All right, thanks.